Choir, thank you so much for your music last week. Y'all, the cantata was just fantastic. Thank you for all your work and how your ministry through that last week. It was just absolutely beautiful. Good morning, congregation. How are you this morning? Can you believe that this is Christmas week? Okay, you don't seem as, as overwhelmed by that as I feel. I mean, it feels like we just put up the decorations like a month or two ago. It always feels like that. April picks on me about being bah humbug. I want you to know, I am not bah humbug about Christmas. Only the getting out and the putting up of the decorations. The rest of it I really like. I enjoy them while they're out. I just don't like getting them down and having to put them back. But otherwise, I love it. And I hope you've had a good Christmas season so far. And I pray that this week is going to be an incredible week for you as well. Uh, we've been looking over the past few weeks at Christmas through the lens of the Advent wreath, which is almost fully lit this morning. We lack one candle that we will light on uh, Christmas Eve. But we started with the first purple candle, which is the candle of prophecy. And it represents hope. And then we, uh, actually Rex taught on the second one, that, that very same Sunday night, because we had to get a little bit out of order because of the cantata. Um, but he taught on the second purple candle, uh, which is the Bethlehem candle, and represents peace. And then two weeks ago, I kind of skipped ahead, and we talked about the pink candle, which I'm not really sure why the shepherd's candle is pink. You'd kind of think it might be brown, or something like, you know, shepherd's manly. But anyway, it's pink. Probably a woman came up with this idea. And um, it's pink and lovely, of course. I love pink. Don't take that the wrong way, please. Um, and it is the candle of joy. And then this morning, we lit the last purple candle, which is the angel candle, which is why we've been singing so much about the angels and all the majestic songs that we've sung this morning. And it's the candle of love. Now, one thing that we've talked about with all of these attributes of Christmas, all of these things that we can take from Christmas, we need to learn from Christmas, we need to give at Christmas, we need to receive at Christmas, we've, we've said that all of these things are impossible without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as real hope. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as peace. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as joy. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as love. Now, another thing I will admit is that there is no possible way to cover all four of these attributes in one sermon apiece, and especially love this morning. There's no way we could ever get down to the bottom of what real, biblical, Christ-centered love really is. And so instead of defining it today, which is what I've done the past few weeks, is try to define these different words and help us to understand a, a biblical definition of it rather than trying to do that because it would be very complicated and very long what I want us to do is look at the ultimate demonstration of love what is the ultimate picture of love and I cannot think of any better place to go to than John chapter 3 John chapter 3 is where Jesus encounters Nicodemus you say well that doesn't have anything to do with Christmas but oh yes it does it has everything to do with Christmas. And Jesus describes the purpose of Christmas in these verses that we know so very well. Now I know in your bulletin it says that we'll be looking at John 3.16. We're actually going to be looking at John 14 through 21, which John 3.16 is in the middle of. But I want us to back up a few verses to kind of get into, uh, into what Jesus is saying in these very famous verses. And Jesus is talking to, to Nicodemus here, and Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's part of the Sanhedrin, part of the ruling council in Jerusalem, and he comes to Jesus when? Do you remember? He comes to Jesus at night under the cover of darkness. Now, we don't know exactly why he did that. He, you know, maybe he didn't want anyone else to know he was coming. That's a possibility. Um, we really don't know all of his intention. We do know that he was curious, at the very least, he was curious enough to seek out Jesus to ask him some questions about who he was and about what he was about and where did he feel like his authority came from. And Jesus answers him with, the, with all the talk of being born again or maybe more literally being born from above, which is another sermon for another time that would love to 
to drill down on a little bit later. But Nicodemus hears the words of being born again, but he's confused. How in the world could someone ever enter back into their mother's womb and be born again? He sees it in completely earthly terms. And Jesus kind of calls him down and says, you're a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? And then we get to verse 14. Now before we read this, I want to do a little bit of review. I know a lot of you probably know this. And for those of you that don't, it's good information for you to know. In the Greek, uh, which is what the New Testament is written in, there are three different words that translate into our English word love. The first one is eros, which we don't find that, that word used in the New Testament at all. But it's the word where we get erotic. It's a sexual, passionate kind of, kind of love. Then there's the word phileo, which is used quite a bit in the New Testament. And it's brotherly love, the love that you would have for a friend or a brother or sister or something like that. Those two words find their basis find their foundation in emotion. That somehow I'm emotionally attached to you because of something you've done, because of who you are, or something like that. I have an emotional connection to you. So that's where those two words find their basis. Now, eros and phileo are used throughout um, writings all, all through biblical times. Not just in, not, well, obviously eros isn't in the Bible, but phileo is in the Bible as well as many other sources outside of the Bible. But there's a third word that God uses for love in the scriptures more, in the New Testament more than any other, and it's the word agape. And this word is found very little outside of the Bible, which should make it important to you and me, because it's different. This is God's love. This is the word that God uses to describe his love for us, to describe our love for him, to describe a husband's love for his wife and and. and vice versa. This is a very important word. And the biggest difference in this word versus phileo and eros is that agape does not find its foundation in emotion. It finds its foundation in the will of God. God chooses to love us. In the Old Testament, you know, God says, you will be my people and I will be your God. Not if you are my people, then I will be your God. It's a one-sided covenant. You will be my people no matter what you do, no matter what happens, no matter how far you stray, you will always be my people and I will be your God. That is agape type love. It is based on God's decision and God's decision alone. He holds the key to it. He is the foundation of it. It doesn't matter how he may feel towards us, because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure God is not always happy with me. Anyone else, you, you feel like God's maybe not always happy with you? Okay. Yeah, everyone should raise your hand there. It's a, just making sure you're awake. But God is not basing his love for us on his feelings. He bases it on his will, on his decision to love us. In Romans 5, verse 8, very famous verse that we probably all know well, we see this demonstration of God's love. God doesn't just tell us about love. He has shown us love in the most beautiful way, the most perfect way that he could have ever done it. And Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, in other words, while we were still separated from God, before we could have had any opportunity to do something that would bring pleasure to God, he demonstrated his love first. It was his will. It was his plan. It is his way. It is not, agape love is not about how you feel, even though I believe agape love leads to feelings. It certainly leads to emotion, but agape love is so much more than a feeling. So Jesus gets together with Nicodemus and Nicodemus isn't understanding what Jesus is saying about being born again. So Jesus takes him to the Old Testament and helps him to understand from a perspective that he would, that he would maybe grasp. And so let's pick up the conversation in verse 14 of John chapter three. Jesus says this, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now there is so much packed into these verses, but the reason that I wanted to start in verse 14 rather than in verse 16 is because I believe that verse 16 refers back to verses 14 and 15 where Jesus takes Nicodemus back to this, this time that Nicodemus would know well, back in Numbers chapter 21, where the people were rebelling against God, they were rebelling against Moses, they were complaining as they often did, and God sent serpents to bite them, and many of them were, were killed for their, their complaining and their uh, arguing against the Lord. And Moses prayed for the people and he prayed that God would forgive them and that God would no longer allow these serpents to kill his people. And so God told Moses to create, to make a, a serpent made of bronze and to put it on a pole and to lift it up. And anyone who looked on that serpent would be healed if they were bitten. Do you remember that story? Nicodemus would have remembered it well. And this is a foreshadowing, that serpent being lifted up on a pole is a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ and his crucifixion. And so just as God loved the Israelites back then so much that he would put a serpent on a pole and tell them that they looked at it, they would be healed. In that same way, he is, he is willing to go even farther in sending his one and only, which means his unique, one-of-a-kind son to die, to be the one that is lifted up on a cross so that when we look at him, we can be healed, we can be cleansed, we can be made whole, and we can, we can no longer have to fear perishing for all of eternity in a place called hell. So for God so, or in that way, he so loved the world. Now that phrase, loved the world, is the only time that I can find in the New Testament that that phrase is rendered that way. That God loved the world. Now there are other places that talk about God's love for us, but not where it said God so loved the world. And I think it's very interesting that God didn't say that he loved, or Jesus didn't say that God loved his chosen people. Or that God loved the elect. He said that God so loved the world. That is every single one of us. There is not one of us who is outside the reaches of God's love. There is not one person, do I believe, on this planet who has ever lived or walked on this planet that is outside the reaches of God's love. His desire is that his love would reach you, would call you to himself, and ultimately would change you, which is what Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus with the whole being born from above, that you cannot encounter the love of God and remain the same. You cannot encounter the love of Jesus Christ and remain the same person that you were before. You cannot encounter the love of God and think the same way. You cannot encounter the love of God and treat people the same way. You cannot encounter the love of God and see the world through the same eyes. You cannot encounter the love of God and not be changed from the inside out. And, I, and folks, I don't mean just changed a little bit where your mama might recognize it or your husband or your wife might recognize it. But I believe when we are changed by the love of God, we are changed so much so that everyone recognizes it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique, one-of-a-kind son. 
that whoever believes, whoever believes in him will not perish. Now that doesn't mean obviously that we won't physically die. That this, this body is stained and marred by sin. As much as you may exercise and try to take care of it and eat right and do all of those things which are well and good, this body is not made to live forever. It is stained and marred by sin, but there will come a day for all those who believe where we will be given a new body that is not stained and marred by sin and that will live forever and ever in a place called heaven. But for those who do not believe, they stand condemned already. See, even in this verse, there is good news about love and there is bad news about God's love. The good news is, is that that love is offered to every single person who has ever lived or breathed. But the bad news is, is that not everyone will believe. There, there's a negative side to God's love, and we see that in verses 17 and 18, where Jesus goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Y'all please forgive me for having to drink so much this morning. But I've had to... I've had to take a, a good bit of medication to be able to stand up this morning and it really dries my, dries my mouth out pretty bad. Have you ever heard it said from people, how could a loving God send someone to hell? Have you ever heard that question asked? Have you ever asked that question yourself? It's a, an interesting question. It seems like an important question until we read these verses and find out that that's not at all how it happens. See, Jesus did not come to this world to condemn the world. He didn't come so that he could say, okay, all the sinners are now going to hell. Because I've come, I've passed that judgment, all the sinners are going to hell, and all the, all the people that I like and love, they're going with me. Jesus came only to seek and to save those who are lost, those who would believe, those who would come to know him. That's what he came to do. But in his coming, he reveals our condemnation. He reveals our sin. Because Jesus is holy. He is blameless. He is without sin. He is without fault. Jesus' whole purpose in coming from the very beginning was to die. We see that back in Genesis when God is handing out the curse to Adam and Eve and the serpent. He tells the serpent that, that Mary's offspring will crush his head and he will bruise her offspring's heel. That is a foreshadowing of Jesus, again, on the cross, being crushing the head of Satan, crushing the enemy, but yet being bruised in a way as well because he would have to die in order for that, that sacrifice to be made complete. But Jesus' presence in the world reveals our sin. We don't we want to be very careful that we don't confuse the word conviction with condemnation. Jesus didn't say that he didn't come to convict. He said he did not come to condemn. But Jesus absolutely convicts us of our sin. Now, why does he do that? Why would Jesus convict us of our sin? Because if he didn't, why would we ever turn to him? If we never realized and understood our need for a Savior, why would we ever surrender to Jesus Christ? I think of the, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 when I think of this word condemnation. And, you know, the men caught this woman in adultery and they surrounded her. They were ready to stone her because that's what the law said should and could be done. And what does Jesus do? He kneels down. And he starts drawing or writing in the sand. Wouldn't you love to know what he was doing? I really would like to know. One of the, that, that's one of the questions I think I want to ask him one day. It may not matter to me anymore once I get there, but today I would like to know. But he starts drawing in the sand. And then they question him about what they should do. And he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they all drop their stones and walk away. And after everyone has walked away... John chapter 8 verse 10 says that Jesus stood up 
and said to the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? In other words, has no one passed the judgment that legally could have been passed on you? Because they could have stoned her and that would have been legal. Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now, what he's not doing here is he's not sweeping her sin under the rug. He's not saying, neither do I convict you. Neither do I think you've done nothing wrong. That's not what he's saying because he goes on to say, go and what? Sin no more. He acknowledges her sin. He acknowledges that the way she's been living is contrary to the way God would have her to live. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't shy away from it. He calls it what it is. But he shows her mercy and grace and forgiveness in that he does not pass on the judgment that legally could, be, could have been passed in allowing her to be stoned to death in that moment. And see, we have a problem with that. We have a problem as human beings of having our sins exposed. It's not something that's comfortable. It's not something that that we enjoy in any way, shape, or form, is it? We spend a lot of time and energy throughout our lives trying to hide our sins, trying to hide our flaws, and pretend like we have none, don't we? Just the, I, I sometimes have thought, you know, when I'm asking God forgiveness for particular sins in my life, I sometimes find him asking me, just imagine how much more energy you would have if you didn't spend so much energy trying to pretend you're perfect. Jesus goes on to give a beautiful illustration. Well, first, in verse 18, he talks about this, this whole question of how can a loving God send someone to hell See, God, Jesus did not come to condemn. If we do not believe, we have condemned ourselves. We have condemned ourselves. He says, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Jesus didn't have to come to to make that happen. We're already sinners. We're already separated from him. We needed a savior, not someone to come and condemn us by the law. But look at how he closes this out in verses 19 through 21. Gives a beautiful and very easy to understand illustration of how this all works. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Do you love darkness rather than light? Do you prefer that people not really know who you really are? Or do you openly share your life and, 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 and do life with other people so that they can see you good and bad, so that they can give, your glo- give glory to your Father in heaven when, when he overcomes those things in your life. God doesn't desire for us to live in darkness. He desires for us to live in the light. And when Jesus came into the world on Christmas morning, the light started shining. But the world doesn't like that. For everyone, verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. One of the commentators I read a little bit of um, in studying for this sermon, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Borshert. But he said this, he said, the world hated Jesus and continues to do so, not merely because of some intellectual reason, but because the deeds of world-oriented people are evil. You ever wonder why the world rejects you and I as Christians? You ever wonder, you know, what, what is it that the world has against all of us believers? You know, we try to help people and we try to minister to people and we, we try to, to do good things. And, you know, why does the world hate us so much? The world isn't hating us, per se. The world is hating our Savior and it's hated him since the first day because we are sinners because his presence in our life exposes our sin not to condemn us but to convict us so that we will turn to him it says but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God 
that verse encourages me that we are called to do life together, to live life together. We are called to live in the light, to even, even when it means I've fallen short, I should live that way in front of you so that you can see God's work in me. I shouldn't walk around pretending like I have it all together. At the same time, I'm not saying we should walk around and flaunt our sin. That's not the point. But that we should be doing life together and sharing life together in such a way that we cause each other to glorify our Father in heaven. I was talking with a young man on Thursday, a young man I've known since he was in middle school, came by my house and he's been struggling. He's been out of church for a while and just, just going through some, some spiritual struggles. And he started sharing with me, you know, I haven't been praying. It's been a long time since I've really, really prayed. And I haven't been reading my Bible. I used to read the Bible all the time and I used to be excited about what God was doing and, and I just haven't been doing that. He said, I haven't been in church regularly. And, you know, growing up, I was in church every time the doors were open. And he was sharing with me how he's trying to get back into church and he's trying to start praying. He's trying to start reading his Bible again and he kind of had this very monotone, kind of downcast approach to telling me, almost as if he was ashamed to tell me these things that are going on in his life. And I, you, know, you know, most of you, you know me. I smile all the time. I, I can't help it. And I'm one of those people, April and I have this same problem that when we're getting fussed at, we, we smile. It's, it's, it's not a good thing when somebody's fussing at you to smile, but, you know, it, it just happens sometimes. You don't mean to do it. But here I am smiling at this young man, and I can't help it. And he's just looking at me like, this is not the reaction I was expecting. I said, buddy, let me tell you something. I am excited about what you're telling me today. And his response was, what? What? I said, I'm excited about what you're telling me today because, buddy, you would not realize that you had moved away from the Lord unless the Holy Spirit was at work in your life revealing that to you. The fact that you realize you haven't been in prayer and that that's a bad thing and you need to start spending time in prayer, that's the Holy Spirit at work in you. That is the work of God reaching out in love to you. The fact that you realize you haven't been in God's word like you're supposed to, like he wants you to, is the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, come back to me, I love you, I am here for you, I have not strayed not one centimeter from you, I'm right here, come back to me. The fact that you realize you haven't been in church and that's a place that you need to be so that you can grow and be around fellow believers that can encourage you and, and, and spur you on in your relationship with Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in you saying that I love you. I want you. I want you every second of every moment of your life. I'm excited about what you're telling me because it tells me that the Holy Spirit is moving in a powerful way in your life and don't you dare miss one second of it. Christmas demonstrates God's agape, unconditional love for every single one of us. And my question to you is have you responded appropriately? Are you serving him like you, for, for those of you who are believers here today and you've been following, are you serving him faithfully? Are you spending time with him like you ought to? Are you doing life with other believers and with non-believers in such a way that they may see God's hand at work in you? For those of you who may not know Jesus, what is holding you back? What is keeping you from accepting and surrendering to the love that, dem that was demonstrated in the birth of a little baby and carried all the way to a cruel cross and to an empty tomb so that you could have eternal life? What about Jesus could you not possibly want? I hope and pray this morning as we Get ready for Christmas that you have responded appropriately to the love that Jesus demonstrated in coming to this earth, humiliating himself, becoming obedient, 
even to death on a cross and whose name is lifted up above every name. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, to say thank you for your love doesn't seem like enough. But there's nothing else that I can think of to say that is more appropriate. You have loved us in a way that we cannot possibly fully understand. There's no possible way that I could ever define it accurately. But you love us in a way that no, no one else can or ever will love us. No child, no spouse, no parent, no friend, no country, no one and nothing could ever love us the way that you do. Thank you, Jesus, that you came not to condemn us, but to save us. And God, I pray for the one today that does not know you, that today would be the day of salvation for them. That they would no longer think of you as a God that is far away, who sends sinners to hell, but they would realize that you are a God who has come to shed light on our sin so that we could turn to you for eternal life and forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you would move in us this Christmas. I pray that this would be a special and unique season for every believer in this place today. May others see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna have our time of invitation. And um, those of you here every week, you know how this works. I'll be down front. If there's anything that I can do to encourage you, to pray with you, um, to answer any questions that you might have, maybe you need a church home and you need a place to serve, we would love to have you join our fellowship and I'd love to answer questions about that if you have them. The most important thing that you could do is to do business with the Lord today. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I would love to see you, as well with this congregation, love to see you walk this aisle and give your life to Jesus today. I would love to have the opportunity to pray with you over that and to encourage you and to celebrate with you as you begin eternal life today. Um, but this altar is open for those of you that may need to pray. I don't know what may be going on in your life. Also, the aisles are open for you to, to interact with each other. If there's someone you need to get a relationship straight with this morning, we'll do that today. Do that during this invitation. This is our time to respond to God as He leads you. So let's stand together and sing and you respond.